let's talk about something that happens to a lot of people, a lot of um, healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, um, counselors, anyone who's not directly involved in the delivery of hospice and palliative care, including trainees. This is the first time you've rotated in hospice and palliative care, or you just entered the field, you have preconceived ideas about what it is. Hopefully, you actually know what it is before you entered palliative care training, or you decided you want to become a specialist and enter the fellowship program. Hopefully, you know what it really is. But for someone who's just coming in, this is a very common reaction. Even consultants in places where hospice and palliative care is barely one and a half decades old, they have some idea, but they don't really know. It looks very strange. So the, the first reaction is, what the heck is that? It, it looks very strange. And the reason why things look very strange is because it's not the kind of thing you would expect. It's not very common. It's not the usual. Now, if you're a doctor, then you know this is um, a specialty field. And in your mind, you're thinking about the specialty fields that you know, you know, the most common ones. Everybody knows what cardiology is or pulmonology is. So right now, with the COVID and all, everybody knows what an intensivist is or an infectious disease specialist is. And their preconceived notions is decently accurate, right? The definition is so simple. It's easy to, to remember. Cardiologist's heart. So you see things in the news, in the television, in the drama series. The cardiologist is the one who does things, procedures, gives medications, and is the go-to person for difficult cases involving heart disease. And the cardiologist is also the one who talks about preventing or promoting heart health. Of course, that's becoming more questionable because um, modern medicine is becoming more and more cure disease focused. But you're still the go-to person, especially in developing countries. And you say COVID, well, it's an infection. You go to the infectious disease specialist. Well, you can't breathe, your oxygen goes down, and the pulmonologist is also involved. You need ventilators, so there's the pulmonologist and, and there's the intensive care specialist. So it's, so it's easy. Now, this thing about hospice palliative care, well, the only thing that's commonly known is they take care of the dying people. Which is strange, because that's not the normal definition of modern medicine. By the 20th century, people started associating modern medicine with the people who tried to look for ways using science and technology to make the disease go away, to make you healthier, to prolong your life. That's pretty much it. And of course, if you think that way, then you see this group of doctors and nurses and other providers, and they're taking care of dying people. Obviously, they're not using medicine and technology to prolong people's lives because dying people means all the specialists, cardiologists or oncologists, if it's a cancer, infectious disease person, if it's a, a severe infection problem, uh, it can come up a way to clearly and definitively prolong their life. So they're not that kind of doctor. Those are different kinds of doctor. It is like we take care of dying people. The question is, well, if you're not the ones who cure and prolong what the heck do you do, right? Well, you know, we're watching them. It seems like the first thing they do is they go in, they introduce themselves, right? And they start talking about strange stuff, like they start talking about suffering. There is another way of looking at things. You might be dying, but you're still alive. Maybe we can help you live until you die. Things like that. And these sound strange. They're not the kind of things scientifically inclined doctors or modern doctors would say, or highly scientific or technological nurses and other care providers would say. Who would say stuff like suffering, distress? For one thing, they're not the object of scientific investigation during the 20th century. How do you study suffering? For you to do decent science, you have to clearly define the problem. So what the heck is suffering? Is, is there an official definition of suffering? Well, no. Right? Because it's such a broad term. Well, can we define suffering? The physical suffering is still broad. Let's go over the suffering, the quality of life, and the distress thing. I mean, how did that happen? Well, the, the easiest way to understand that is to go back to the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, we're not talking about the Middle Ages when the religious groups care of the dying. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we put that in the, our textbooks. 
but we're talking about the the modern version of post recent palliative care that that grew and uh, became a specialized field in nursing and medicine. And that's what we're talking about. So we can peg that mid twentieth century. That's when it all started. And so what happened during that time? This is a younger field. Medicine, pediatrics, and, and surgery, and the other fields are, are fairly well established. And the idea during that time is, you know, with enough science and technology, I mean, this is like 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and people are, are thinking science can solve everything, right? You know, this is the time we sent a person to the moon, right? And of course, this is the time we, we witnessed the nuclear bomb. So then the science fiction movies during that time is very optimistic, like, you know, science will get us here by 2000. Of course, you know, most of the stuff they thought about didn't come true, but everybody thinks science can deliver so much. And so the question is, why do you need another field if, you know, you have firmly well established fields? This hospice is a, it's a reaction to something going wrong or it's a reaction to something that's not right with modern medicine. And the thing that's not right with modern medicine is the idea itself, science. So for you to do science, one, you need time. I mean, you cannot just do science for one year and you solve all the problems in the world. And for you to solve all the problems in the world and do a scientific undertaking to investigate things and to come up with decent procedures or ways to make the disease go away or make a problem go away, you have to define the problem well. So that's how uh, enterprise look like. First, you, you try to come up with a problem that's controllable, right? The heart disease, heart attacks. And then you try to figure out what it is and you try to figure out if you can give drugs or do procedures to prevent the heart attack from causing any problems or to prevent the heart attack from happening. Or, or you define something like your blood pressure is up and the blood pressure will, will cause this. Well, that's easy. You, know, you can measure it. And then you look for drugs or things to make the blood pressure go lower. And that's how it works. So, that's the reason why it became a cure appearing enterprise. The easiest things to study or the e easiest research format would be looking for cures or looking for something. If there's a problem, you do something and it gets better. Or you're sick, you do something, you live longer. And that's the easiest thing to do. Most of the 20th century is geared towards that. I mean, it's not holistic at all because how can you do science if you cannot narrow down the problem to something they can control and manage in in a research design, right? The holistic, comprehensive kind of research belong to sociology and the other non-scientific fields, the non-scientific fields as far as um, doctors are concerned. So it's about cure. And so what happens to people you cannot cure? Well, you think you can cure this disease entity that's going to kill this person. So the answer is, you know, we can't make this person live longer is going to die now but later on with enough science and technology maybe 10 more years uh, we'll be able to solve this and the other person 10 years from now won't die that's that's the idea it's very optimistic and then the question is what about this person now what do you do with that that's the problem with the, the developing cure attitude the medical profession and the nursing profession it's main job instead of for ways to cure you and prolong your life and it still is the dominant point of view. Even if we tell ourselves we care, we take care, um, you know, efficacy sounds good, you know, it makes you feel better. But if you look at our behaviors and our attitudes and the way we really think when faced with real life patients or, and look at the, all our textbooks, it's, it's predominantly we cure, not we care. Right? And we want to be scientific. So what kind of scientific stuff can you put on something that sounds like care? Who does research on care? In the 20th century, or the research on the holistic approach to healthcare or medical care compared to the research with a narrower focus on cure for prolonged life. I mean, it's a no context I and mean, it's very, very little. And even that very little stuff that we have, the very scientifically inclined professionals will just look at it and punch holes out those research because, well, they're not funded. And if, even if they are, I mean, how can you come up with something as clean as a clinical trial? Of course, it can, you know, you can punch holes into those kinds of researches. So it's underdeveloped. Nobody cares about it. The other thing with that is the emotional part, the spiritual part, and the existential part. Of course, if you talk about suffering, that, you know, 
suffering is not just physical symptoms, is underdeveloped for the same reason. How do you study emotion? How do you study existential distress or spiritual distress? Are they even scientific? Of course, the emotional part later on went under psychiatry. But the thing with psychiatry is if you're just feeling sad or you're very sad, but not pathologically sad, there's no drug we can give you, right? So, so that's the problem with that. You have to be sick enough. That's also the reason why preventive medicine, lifestyle medicine became underdeveloped. There are big holes that are not being addressed. Are there, there are gaps in care that are not being addressed? That's why those things happen. But, you know, that's, we'll talk about those other stuff some other time. So when people look at this, hospice and palliative care thing, there's just a lot of confusing things about it. What happened Why we have hospice and palliative care? So we go back to what you just said, and the question is, what do you do if you cannot cure? You know, if you think that's what modern medicine is all about, then what about these people you don't have cures in? Science takes time. Maybe you think you can cure them uh, with science, but not right now. So what do you do with them? And that's where the problem was. The entire enterprise, or most of it, the research, the personnel, the caregiving, the resources are being poured into this cure approach that there's not a lot of resources and personnel and, and things like that being poured into people they cannot cure. And so a lot of these people are just in the hospital waiting for death, or most of them, since staying in the hospital is such an expensive thing to do, or at home, waiting to die and there's no doctor because doctors I think they're only for a cure and then people are saying you know if you want to do medicine you have to be scientific but the problem is where's the science so that's the problem with evidence-based scientific practice you can only do that if you already have the evidence and the science what if you already have a problem right now you cannot just say well you know let's wait two or three more years and you let this problem keep on causing havoc that doesn't work, right? It's the same problem you've had with COVID right now. It happened last year and things looked really bad and people are getting worried and they asked some medical people and the medical people would say stuff like, you know, we don't have evidence yet that the study for one or two months. And then the answer is, well, you don't have one or two months. Even things as simple as wearing masks. Well, we're not so sure. Give us time to study it. Well, it's spreading right now really fast. So that's the problem with science. The situation during that time is the same thing. Of course, it's not that urgent. It's not like a pandemic. You know, we'll figure that one out. Make, give us 10 more years and, and the thing that's killing this person, it's not going to kill the other person 10 years later. But what about these people right now? Shouldn't we be doing something about it? So that's the key idea. We should be doing something about it. We're doctors, we're nurses. Those people asking are going back to their sense of what it is to be doctors and nurses. Their sense of what the medical profession, the healthcare profession, the nursing profession is all about. Even if you look at everything that describes the profession, even the oath that they take, it's all about caring. I mean, it's not just looking for cure. If you can't cure someone, you still have to take care of this someone, right? That's what you're supposed to be doing. That's the reason why there is such a thing as a physician. That's the reason why there's such, there are such things as nurses. Because you're supposed to be caring for the sick, not just caring for the sick. Um, when I say these things, you know, things pop into our heads. When we were in medical school, and somebody says stuff like, you know, we have to take care of the patient, and then they flash this thing, and then it's, it's so, so catchy that we, remember versions of it like you know you cure sometimes you care always and you feel good really in practice that's not what we do you try to cure and if you cannot cure you know you you try to get away from it right of course the training also doesn't help with that you know if you can cure someone and somebody actually dies or gets worse you get called out and you stand in front and people start asking you what you did wrong that's how medical training felt like during our time and I think there's still some versions of that right now, right? Even during residency or fellowship, you, you get to stand in front. What did you do wrong? So in your mind, it's getting drilled 
the, the tour thing is getting through. I mean, nobody makes you stand in front and ask you, did you take care? Did you care for your patient? Well, usually when they ask care, it means cure, right? You don't get grilled for not caring too much, right? You get grilled for not coming up with something to make them live longer or for preventing a, a medical crisis, right? And yet we, you know, we always recite that because it's good, especially if we're talking to other non medical people. Oh yeah. We cure sometimes. We care always and then, and, and they nod and you know, if we think we're so good and we feel good. Of course, we know we don't really do that too much, but why would you think about it? Right. So now you've heard it. Now it's out in the open and hopefully you can do something about it. At least for yourself, right? Or at least for your generation right? to, to make, you know, the, the idea is to train you so that you can make medicine or medical practice and healthcare practice better. We won't be good teachers if we're only training you to be just like us, right? Although some teachers think that way, but you know, that's, that's not really the idea. So, so what do you do with that? Well, you know, we should take care of them. And then the question is, what do you do? Well, we cannot cure them. And then the answer is, well, you know, if you cannot cure, you care. Yeah, but what kind of care? Because by that time, people associate care with cure or prolonging life or it's, it's something. What kind of care? Well, well, what do you do when your mom is dying and the doctors say that's all they can do? Well, you, you try to help her have a good night's sleep. You, if you're sad, you try to make her less sad. You talk to her. Um, if she's throwing up, you try to come up with ways to make her stop throwing up. I mean, because she's still alive. It's not like she died when the doctor said she will die. I mean, she's still alive. There's still life left. It could be one year or a few months, even if it's a few days, your mom's still alive, right? So those are the things you, you do for her. What is that? That's caring. Right? So if you try to make it more technical or try to come up with a, one to two sentence definition of that kind of caring. So what are you actually doing? Well, well, the nausea, the lack of sleep, and the sadness is making you suffer, right? So there's physical suffering, emotional suffering. Then she might be even questioning her existence and God, and because she knows she's about to die. So that's spiritual existential suffering. So what you're actually doing, you should try to address the suffering, try to minimize it. You cannot make it completely go away, but you're trying your best to make her suffer less. And so that's what you're doing. Or if you don't like the word suffering, because suffering has so many meanings. For example, Judeo-Christian, Christian or Catholic religion, suffering can be a good thing. Right? It's not completely a bad thing. You know, it's sometimes its outcome is a good thing. Right? So if you don't want to use that word, because it's a loaded word, maybe you can come up with something like distress. That's the simple, right? several levels lower than suffering. You know, things that make you distressed, feeling sad, feeling anxious, feeling fearful, throwing up, being in pain, not sleeping well, spiritual distress. And so you can use distress if you want. So that's the reason why we have those words. The psychosocial sciences during that time hated those words because they're, they're negative. It makes people feel bad. Half the, the second half of the 20th century is about the positive aspects and making things more positive and more hopeful. So we can go quality of life instead of talking about suffering and distress. Your mom cannot sleep, aren't you throwing up? And, and you're trying to make these better. So what are you really doing? Well, you're doing that because she still has some weeks left or months left or even days left and you want her to still experience life fully and well during her remaining time on earth, right? Well, you can say you're trying to optimize her quality of life, trying to optimize her functioning. You can, you're trying to help her live better. That's where the quality of life comes in. And that's the more common modern definition. Instead of using minimizing suffering or minimizing distress or addressing distress, you say improving the quality of life. Of course, that quality of life can mean other stuff aside from just the uh, suffering and distress. You can help her be more mobile, so she can go to the mall, she can go to the restaurants, 
and just because you're terminal doesn't mean you, you just stay at home and wait for your and wait for your body to give out and die, right? Not unless you're you're very close to death. You should be able to do the stuff that you can still do, right? So that's improving function, improving mobility, and and things like that, allowing you to live as normal as you can possibly can. That's optimizing your quality of life, which is another term. But no matter what you use, suffering, distress, and quality of life, because you cannot just work with those terms. It's not like heart disease you know, or coronary heart artery disease. So those are not the same things, right? And heart disease, you can define it. And have a list of the different diseases of the heart. And when we talk about suffering, it's a, a holistic concept. There's physical, there's emotional, there's spiritual, relation, and all sorts of um, suffering and distress. And right? quality of life, like what is quality of life? Well, there's different dimensions. The same thing. You can say physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, existential. You can say all those things also. And then when you say physical, well, there's a whole bunch of physical symptoms. When you say emotional, well, there's a whole bunch of emotional problems. So it's still a big thing. But that's what you do, right? You cannot do anything less than that. If you are supposed to take care of the dying person, that's what you do. It's not like they have all the physical problems in the world, or it's not like they're experiencing all the different types of emotional distress that anyone can experience. But still, it's still a lot of physical problems, a lot of emotional problems, a lot of things, and you're supposed to take care of that. Now, of course, the answer is you cannot. No matter how many staff or resources you have, and which you don't, because in most places you're not really a great money earning enterprise, and nobody's really willing to pour that much money into you, or at least as much resources as, as you really need to do a fairly decent job, right? But that's the definition. To remember those things or picture those things, you can always use the the figure that the Canadians came up with. And then you can see how many boxes there are. The boxes don't even contain all the details, just to give you a picture of the different areas of concern. And then you look at those things and you say, well, it's a huge enterprise. How do you get all the personnel and the resources and the gadgetry? How do you do all the research to advance the care aspect of those things? You know, when we say nausea, the research that we have are not people who are dying and nauseated. Those people are not included in the clinical trials of the 20th century. And then just because it works for people who are not dying, it doesn't mean those are the best medications for people who are dying. And the other thing is that people who are dying with nausea are dying with all sorts of different diseases. And if they have two different diseases and they're both nauseated, the medication that works for one might not be the medication that works for the other. So, so it's a really difficult thing to just control with science. But you have to start somewhere. And of course, the most important thing is your values should be different. So that's a financial aspect. Definitely, you know, no matter what happens, this kind of care, this kind of population is not going to give you as much earnings or income, as much financial return. If you're a doctor or a hospital or a corporation or a company or a healthcare corporation, or a pharmaceutical or medical gadget company, and it's not going to give you as much return as people who are not dying, right? 